going? Good evening. Thanks for joining us this evening for uh, class. Not many of us here tonight, but uh, thankful for those that are. Thankful for y'all that are joining us. Thought about doing a couple songs before we start. Ain't many of us here, but we'll sing aloud. And a lot of songs we don't get to sing much, so thought we'd thought we would uh, maybe start doing on Wednesday night. Try to we're trying to get some guys to start doing devos again. So if you're interested in doing that, let Gary or one of us know so we can get you on the get you on the schedule. Are there any announcements particularly that we need to make this evening that anyone knows of? Okay, I guess we're kind of in a holding pattern. Pat, uh, remember Pat Vaughn and your prayers for cancer, and Ray, his results coming, and Jim and Catherine, always keep them in your prayers as they struggle with their health issues, and and uh, remember them in your prayers. Well, I don't know. They did the thing, but I don't know when the results. He didn't say. I think, yeah, I think this week he was supposed to go see them this week. So uh, Anyway... Uh, let's have a let's have a song, huh? Before we start tonight. Okay, I got it. <laughs> huh? My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is hard, my prayers are cold, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. A little low, sorry about that. Have to go up. I ain't used to leading. Oh, that's a good song. Ah, sung that in a long time. Somewhere the sun is shining. Somewhere the sombers well. Hush then thy sad repining. God lives and all is well. Somewhere, somewhere, beautiful Isle of somewhere, land of the true, where we live anew, beautiful Isle of somewhere. Somewhere the day is longer, somewhere the task is done, somewhere the heart is stronger, somewhere the good and one, somewhere, somewhere. Beautiful Isle of Somewhere, land of the true, where we live anew. Beautiful Isle of Somewhere, somewhere the load is lifted, close by an Somewhere the clouds are rifted, somewhere the angels wait, somewhere, somewhere, beautiful Iola, somewhere, land of the true, where we live anew. Beautiful Isle of Somewhere. 
First time I ever sung that song with a junior Bailey. I remember that at a funeral years ago. Sit right over there. <laughs> junior and Katie and Bailey and Claire Lee Evington and a whole bunch of them that we have no longer have with us. Let's have a prayer before we start. Here, you can leave your prayer. Can I clear your hand? Bow with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, to look at your word, to study your word, and to hopefully take from that word something that we can apply to our daily lives. Father, we can for sure add to the knowledge that comes along with it. We ask that your blessing be upon Rex, that he have a ready recollection of what he has studied, and that everything we do be in accordance with thy will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We're in uh, Samuel, and uh, 1 Samuel 9 and 10, Saul is going to be anointed as king. He... Uh, you know, we kind of got into him a little bit last week about God was going to call him and raise up a king, and Samuel kind of brought that to Saul's attention. Saul wasn't exceptionally receptive of that. You're going to see tonight he's not really that receptive of this coming and takes a little bit to get him into it. Of course, he will He will get into it. Samuel took the flask of oil. He's going to anoint him. That was real big in the Old Testament. And actually, there's a recipe in the Old Testament for anointing oil, so... There's actually a certain oil that's used. It's not just, not just oil. Uh, it's a mixture of things. And uh, you can buy it on Amazon if you're interested in that. And, uh, but there is an anointing, huh? It's, uh, I don't know, Gary can tell you. Do you remember? Yeah, olive oil, or cinnamon. That's right. There's different oils for different things. That's right. There's different oil for prophets, for kings, for priests, and for sickness. And it's a mixture, and the recipe's in the Bible. It tells you how to make it. It's a hen, a hen of olive oil, I think, and then you add everything to it. It's a pretty big batch. I think I figured it up one time. Did you ever figure that up? I think I figured that up one time. It's around like 40 or 50 gallon. So it's a, it was a pretty big batch of oil when you got done. Yeah, it does. It just didn't anoint you, and they bathed you. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so, uh, and they did that for a lot of reasons. One thing in that culture, uh, you oiled your hair because of head lice and other vermin. So, uh, and another thing was bathing was infrequent in those days. As early in this country, it was, and they used it for uh, the smell to keep you smelling better, kind of like a perfumer's oil. And they believed it had medicinal qualities, like a lot of people believe oil has today. And so there were a lot of different reasons. But to anoint a king, like Gary said, that was a different oil. Priests and king, that was a different thing. And you weren't supposed to use that for other things. So it was a, there was a division in there. And, but this anointing was to signify it, to, to uh, signify God's, the outpouring of God upon him, more or less. Uh, it was a public act. He says, Has not the Lord anointed you a ruler? So he's talking about, of course, a, a uh, spiritual anointing. You know, hadn't the Lord anointed you or appointed you to do that? And they said, uh, says, You will find. So then he's going to give him some confirmation. And that happens a lot in the Old Testament. You want the sun to go forward, the sun to go back. You want the dew on the fleece, the dew on the ground, the, the dew on the ground or not on the fleece. Um, this idea of confirmation. In other words, I'm going to tell you, Saul might not totally be believing this. In other words, I don't really believe maybe God really has called me to do this. So Samuel's going to give him these confirmations. He's going to say, you're going to find certain things certain ways, and that's going to tell you that God is involved in this. So he says, you're going to find two men close to Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin, Azelza, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. 
Behold, your father has ceased to be concerned about the donkeys and anxious for you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you will go on further from there. You will come as far as the oak of Tabor, and there three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you. One is carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread. Pretty specific. Another carrying a jug of wine. So it's very specific. It wasn't generic. It wasn't like, well, you're going to see these guys. You're going to see this guy doing this, this guy doing this, this guy doing this. Somebody's going to specifically say this to you. You're going to know I'm telling you the truth because I'm a prophet of God, and these things are going to happen, and it's going to confirm to you. There's two confirmations going on with Saul, and you'll see that tonight. One is... God has to convince Saul, confirming Saul that I've, I've asked you to be king. And then the other thing is God, he has to confirm to the people that God's wanted Saul to be king. So there's two different confirmations here. So Samuel knows what's going on. But Samuel needs Saul to know what's going on. And Samuel needs the Israelites to know what's going on. So he's got to confirm this in two different ways. So he says, you're going to come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it shall be, as soon as you come to the city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a harp, tambourine, flute, and lair before them, and they'll be prophesying. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily, and you shall prophesy with them and be changed into another man. And it shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires for God is with you. So, you know, you're only going to do this, but you're going to get an anointing of the Spirit. So that's kind of reminiscent or kind of, kind of what happened in Acts, kind of what happened when the gospel went to Cornelius and in Acts chapter 10. You know, the Spirit was going to not, only they were, the Spirit was going to confirm him too. So Saul was going to be convinced by the time this happened that God had called him to be king. God had, God had called him to do this. So that's, this is part of that, part of that confirmation. And it happened when he turned, <clears throat> God changed his heart, and all those signs came about on that day. So specifically, all this stuff's going to happen. And when that happens, God, Saul's going to know, well, God uh, has called me to do this. In other words, I, God's confirming me to be, this, to be this king. So there's a confirmation. And the Spirit of God came about him mightily, and he prophesied, and it came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied now with the prophets, that the people said, What has happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? A man there said, Now who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. So Saul is going to be convinced that God is calling him to do that. God's directly calling him to do a specific thing. Now, you know, that would be kind of nice today in some ways. Maybe it would be kind of scary if God did that to us, like called us directly to do something. But, you know, God calls us through the word. God calls all of us to do, to do things. So, but this is specifically Saul, going to be king, king of Israel, and this is how this is going to start. Are there any comments on that? So it's kind of one of those deals that uh, Saul needs to be convinced. You know, he's not just convinced. Samuel, remember, he really didn't even know who Samuel was. He goes, who's that prophet? And what's Samuel? He really didn't even know. So, you know, he isn't convinced that maybe that Samuel's a prophet of God. But after this happens, then he becomes convinced. Well, this is what, this is what I need. This is what I need to do. So he said to him, well, where did you go? And he said to look for the donkeys. And then we went to Samuel, and Saul's uncle said, Tell me what Samuel said. He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. He did not tell him about the matter of the kingdom, which Samuel had mentioned. Therefore Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the sons of Israel, Thus says the Lord, I brought Israel up from Egypt. I delivered you. <clears throat> God reminds them of this a lot, doesn't he? You know, God continually reminds them, doesn't he? Continually reminds them that I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt. That's a continual reminder in the Old Testament. And I think, you know, it's because why? Because we're forgetful. We're forgetful people, right? I mean, so he had to keep reminding them. That was always his first thing. I'm the God who delivered you. I'm the deliverer. God the deliverer. And so it's always kind of his first Thing. I did it, I delivered you from the power of the kingdoms, but you have rejected your God 
who delivers you from all your calamities and your distresses, set a king over us. So God still looks at this as a rejection of him as king. Um, not so much as Israel wanting a king. Israel wants to be like the nations around him, but God doesn't desire that. So why does God give in to them? Why does God, why do you think God gave in? Why didn't he just say, no, I'm sorry, but you're not going to get a king. I'm not going to do that. You know what finally swayed him? Does God change his mind? Sometimes, absolutely. You know, why do we pray, right? You know, uh, God can be swayed. God can change his mind. God sometimes gives us, gives in to us things that we probably are not really that good for us. You know, sometimes we need to let God's will be involved in that. Yeah, they wouldn't accept it. Yeah, I agree. They were to the point they were going to have a king, whether God put one over them or they did it themselves. And God finally just said, well, enough's enough, you know. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and they, yeah, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. That's right. You know, yeah, go ahead, Gary. Yeah, but way before. Yeah, I think God knew it, don't you? Right. All the things that Samuel did, right? I mean, that Solomon did, right? <laughs> yeah, Gary says in Deuteronomy 17, God gives instructions on a king, you know, what to do in the case of a king. So, you know, like Gary says, that way predates this, way predates this. So, you know, was God looking ahead? Did God know eventually that would happen? Yeah, probably so. You know, God God has foreknowledge, you know. I think there's, well, that's a big thing with people. You know, people are like, you know, God has foreknowledge. There's, there's a big difference between that and predestination. And sometimes we forget that. You know, can God choose to know the decision we're going to make? Absolutely. God knows everything. Does God choose to know that? I don't always think he does. You know, I think we're free will people. Um, we have to be careful how we think about that. You know, God doesn't predestine us to do something. That's not the case at all. That's why we pray for wisdom. That's why we pray for guidance. That's why I pray for understanding. If we really thought that everything in our life was set, every breath we took was set, every day was numbered, why would we even pray? You know, why would we even care? Why would we even try to change anything? It would make no sense. No, there's no point to that. You know, but the truth is we do that because God does change. God will change his mind. God can change his mind. That's repeatedly, you see that repeatedly in the Old Testament. God can be swayed. So our prayer is for that. Sometimes we pray to sway God. We pray for him to help us to make the right decision. If there's three paths to go, we pray for God to help us to the right path. How does he do that? Well, I think he does that a lot of ways. I think he does it by putting people in our lives, wise people in our lives. Maybe he does it by hindering things that we shouldn't do. And God guides us. You know, if we allow that to happen, God can guide us in decisions. The problem with me is I'm pretty stubborn. And when I set my mind one way, sometimes regardless of what God puts in my path, I tend to bulldoze right on through it anyway um, and, and make the wrong decision. But that's just me. Maybe y'all's a little more uh, wise-hearted than I am. But, you know, that's kind of my fault, I know. So, I, so God can guide those, and that's what we pray for. We pray for God to do that. Um, you know, we have a lot of foreknowledge in our lives, don't we? We know, expect things to happen a certain way. Does it mean that we make them happen that way? You know, if your child's hanging on the back of a, of a bar stool, jumping up and down, you pretty well know that's going to end bad. I mean, but you don't make it end bad, but you pretty well know if that continues, 
it's not going to end very good. You know, we have some foreknowledge ourselves, and when we use that, sometimes it helps us from getting in trouble. But, you know, in this case, uh, you know, Saul is set up to be king. God knew this was going to happen, obviously, just as God knew that uh, Adam, that Eve was going to eat the apple. You know, God knew that too, right? God didn't make her eat it. That was her decision. But did God know that she was going to do it? Yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure absolutely. I'm sure when God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, he knew that at some point somebody was going to eat it. But I think if any of us here had done the same thing, if we put a candy bar in a room full of children and told them don't eat the candy bar, I don't think there's one of us in here that would expect to come back in a half hour and find that candy bar on that table, right? We wouldn't do it because we know, just like God knows, right? So, you know, there's a lot to think about when we think about that. And we have to be careful how we say that around people because I, that's a big thing with me. And, you know, I, I think it's dangerous when we start telling people, well, that's God's plan, that's God's plan. we got to be careful with saying things like that because, you know, God's plan's not evil. God's plan's not bad things to happen. God's plan is not ill. All good things come from God, James says. If God's will was carried out always upon the earth, there would be no sinners. There would be no sin, right? So God's will is often, most of the time, not carried out. Most people will be lost. Very few will be saved. But yet God says what? God, God wants all men to come to repentance. That's God's will. God's will is that all men repent and turn to God. But we know, and God knows, that the truth is very few will repent and turn to God. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, right? Many there find it. Straight is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find that gate. God knows that. So we really have to be careful when we're talking to people what they think about, you know, what they think. Because a lot of people perceive that as being bad, right? And I think, um, you know, I think we should sometimes have a, maybe I should write a bulletin article on things we should and shouldn't say, you know, at funerals and at, when people are grieving and when people are sick, there's just, we really need to be careful our, our wordage, you know, what we say to people because um, we can do a lot of damage if we, if we say that right. Um, Leela would probably back me up on that. So uh, as Christians, we need to speak God's word. We need to, we need to speak God's word. And I think, it's not comforting to people to think that God wills terrible things to happen. I don't, I don't find comfort in that. So I think we need to be careful. Any comments? So he says, uh, now he's going to confirm Saul to the people. Because he's already confirmed Saul to Saul, even though Saul's, I don't think, real happy about it at the minute. But now he's going to confirm him to Israel. And he's going to do that by lots. You remember I put up a proverb the other day, or there's a proverb that said, the lots are cast in the lap, but God determines the outcome. Um, a lot of times in the Bible, people cast lots. They cast a lot to replace Judas when he, was, when he committed suicide as an apostle. The, uh, in, in um, oh my gosh, uh, Jonah. Uh, you know, they cast lots to determine it was Jonah that was the problem. Uh, the sailors did, not even godly guys, right? The sailors cast lots to determine. They cast lots for Jesus' garments at the cross. Um, the pre high priest had the Urim and Thurim in his ephod, behind his ephod, and he would use the Ur these stones, the Urim and Thurim, to divine God's will. So that was a real common thing, real accepted practice, to divine the will of God and he says, uh, so, so he's bringing them forward. Samuel brought all of them. The tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. So basically, he brought all 12 tribes. He cast a lot. We don't exactly know how that works, um, exactly how the lot determined who was what, but it determined Benjamin. So the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And he brought them by families, and he cast lots again, and the Matrite family was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he couldn't be found. Therefore, they inquired further, has the man come here yet? So the Lord said, behold, he is hiding himself by the baggage. So this is prophetic. The Lord said, this is where he is. I don't know what baggage 
It is. I don't know. I tried to figure that out. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. I guess they traveled to come. I guess they brought their suitcases. I, I don't know. But, but he was by the baggage. And um, they ran, took him, and he stood among a head taller, which we saw that before, and that's going to be reiterated. He's very handsome, very tall. And Samuel said, you see him who the Lord has chosen. So he's confirming Saul. Now he's confirmed Saul to the people. So Saul's been confirmed. He's been done that. But guess what? Uh, long live the king. Samuel told the people the ordinance of the kingdom, wrote them in a book, placed it before the Lord. He sent them away. And Saul, even though he's now king, guess what? Saul goes back to the farm. So, you know, in the Bible, that happens a lot, doesn't it? You know, Peter goes back to the boat. Saul goes back to the farm. Saul goes back to the farm. But there's some valiant men who who go with him. They've joined up. And you see that with King David. David had his mighty men. So there's these valiant men that have joined themselves to Saul. They're going back. But there's also some worthless men, worthless fellows. It says, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him, did not bring him any present, but he kept silent. So some men, like in anything, some men are with him, some men are against him. Now, in kingdoms, of course, Saul's not really used to being king yet, but in kingdoms, that never really ends well because the king generally gets rid of those people who are opposed. But in this case, Saul has some, he, he has some mercy upon them. It says, in this hosh, the, Ammon, the Ammonite came and besieged Jabesh Gilead. So this is, uh, so now we get in this case where now there's a conflict. So, now this conflict has occurred, and now, you know, what are we going to do? Well, they don't look to Saul, number one. They don't look to God, number two, in this. They're not looking to that. They're trying to make a treaty for themselves. So they're not looking to any godly deliverance. They're not looking. They're not praying to God to what to do. Saul's king now, but they're not looking for Saul what to do. They're going to try to make this covenant, make this covenant or this treaty. We would call it a treaty. So they said, what will we do to serve you? So they go to Jabosh Gilead, the Ammonites do, and they basically say, we're going to take you over. We're going to conquer you. And the men of Jabosh Gilead, they say, well, let's make a deal. You know, let's make a treaty. We don't want to go to war with you. You'll probably whoop us. So we just soon make a treaty. So the Ammonite said, he said, if I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and make it a reproach on Israel. So he says, here's the deal. I won't attack you. I won't kill you. I won't plunder you. But I got to gouge out every one of your right eyes. Well, there's a lot of speculation about why he said that. Some people say, well, they wouldn't be very good warriors because they wouldn't handle depth perception. I don't know if that's anything to or not, but they would still be good slaves because they would have one eye that could still tend the fields. I don't know. Um, that was his deal. Pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Pretty tough treaty. Gouge out everybody's right eye. And they're like, well, give us seven days. Uh, let us think about it. And so he says, if we can't deliver, then I guess that's what we'll do because we can't beat you, so we're just going to have to have you gouge out our right eyes, which seems pretty tough to me and then they go to Saul and guess what Saul is Saul is plowing which I always thought was odd every time I read this Saul is king valiant men went with him but he's plowing he ain't building the kingdom he ain't putting in cabinet members he's not doing any of them kingly things right He's back plowing the fields. Like, he really doesn't know what to do. He really doesn't know how to be king. There hasn't been any kings before in Israel, right? There's no palace. There's no, there's no place. There's no court. There's no any of that. There's, no, there's been no kings. So he does not stepping into anything. So I guess he's like, well, what do I do? I mean, I'm king, but I guess I'll go home. So he goes home, and the men come to get him because these valiant men went with him. So he's got some force. They come with him. And he says, what's the matter with the people? They weep. So they related the words. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily. You know, we're going to see the Spirit 
well, I guess we should wait till we get to that, but really interesting on Saul. Um, actually, spirit in the Old Testament is a very interesting, very interesting study. Um, but anyway, so the spirit of the Lord, it says here, came upon him, and he, and he heard these words, and that's kind of what we saw with Samson. Spirit of the Lord come upon Samson, and Samson would do. And he took the yoke, and he cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout the territory. And he said, whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done. So he's still aligned with Samuel. Samuel's an old man here, but Samuel has clout. Samuel's been judge of Israel for 40 years. Samuel has a lot of clout. Samuel's the one that anointed him, so he's going to throw Samuel's name out there too. And he's going to say, we're going to go, we're going to fight these people. And uh, so come out to fight him. And he numbered them. And this is the biggest Israelite force, except for one time in the book of Judges. This, I think, is the biggest Israelite force. But there's something really interesting about this. And it's, it's sort of, it sort of gives you um, a premonition to what's going to happen. Because Israel's not numbered together. And that's how this is going to work out in the end. Those of you who know the story, right? You're going to have Judah, and you're going to have Israel. Judah's not, it's not numbered together. It's not one country. They're one country, they're one group of people, but he splits it in the, num in the numeration. He says there were 3,000, Israel were 300,000, and Judah were 30,000. Now that's going to be Israel's downfall. I mean, that's how it's going to wind up dividing the kingdom, and you're going to wind up with Israel and Judah, but that's already happening. And under David, it'll all kind of come together, and everybody's kind of going to be happy under David. But then when Solomon comes along, they get unhappy again. And by the time Solomon dies, they're really unhappy. And that's how come they, that kingdom splits, and the northern tribes get carried off by the Assyrians, and then Judah winds up getting carried off by the Babylon, Babylonians like 100 years later. And But that's where that split is. And God doesn't rescue Israel because the line of Christ is not through Israel, it's through Judah. So Christ, God rescues Judah. He brings them back to Jerusalem and he rescues them. But God doesn't rescue Israel. When Israel gets carried off by the Assyrians, they just get carried off and God just forgets them. So, but you start to see this. This is the beginning of that, the split. You kind of see it throughout the Old Testament. There's always kind of a split the northern tribes and Judah. But now it starts to become more pronounced. And Saul is not going to do a lot to bring that together. David will, but Saul doesn't. Um, you shall say to the men, tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you will have deliverance. So they went and told the men of Jabesh they were glad, and the men of Jabesh said, tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. And the next morning, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came in the midst of the camp. So Saul is, ex is exerting himself as a military leader now. Saul's went from being the son of Kish that was, couldn't find the donkeys, right? And now he's exerting himself as a leader, a military leader. The people are following him. And this victory is going to confirm him in the eyes of Israel. He's, this is going to change him. This victory is going to change Saul because now he's going to have the confidence to be king and the people are going to rally behind him and this guy can be our king and this guy can be our leader. And so the, it's going to have that confidence and this is going to turn it that way. Um, and then the people said to Samuel, who is that that said, shall Saul reign over us? So now we're going back to the previous, back where he was confirmed and some men went with him, the valiant men with him, and the other one said, who is this man that he shall reign over us? And they kind of let that go. But now that he's had this victory, now they say, go get them men that said, who shall reign over us? And let's put them into death. You know, now we see Saul's a guy, so we need to get rid of them other guys. But Saul, in probably a wise move, Saul said, not a man should be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. So, so Saul, he makes it positive. He starts to unite them. He starts to say, we're not going to put them to death. You know, no man, the Lord's give us deliverance, and we're not going to put any man to death today uh, over that. So Saul starts to unite the people, unite Israel now, and say, you know, we're not going to do that. We're not going to divide. We're not going to do those things. 
And Samuel said to the people, come let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom. Now Gilgal is kind of on the border between Israel, the northern Israel, and the southern Judah. So Gilgal is kind of on that border, kind of a disputed territory. So it's a really good place for them to go and to make this kingdom because they're trying to unite Judah, southern Judah, and northern Israel. So they picked this town kind of on that border, on the middle, and that helps to unite them together as one as one people, which is what which is what they're trying to do. They went to Gilgal. They made they made Saul king before the Lord. So he was already king. But guess what? Now it's been confirmed to Saul. It's been confirmed to Israel. He's won this great military battle. The people are behind him now. His popularity's good. Things are good. Now we're going to confirm him as king. We're going to get behind him. He's going to be our king. And we're going to and we're going to be this people. And he sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. And Saul and all the men of Israel rejoice greatly. So Saul starts to come into power now. But of course, as that happens, then he's going to start doing all those things that God said a king will do. He's going to start requiring taxes. He's going to start requiring people to serve him. He's going to start having a kingdom. All that has to be supported. This is the beginning. The beginning of the end, you know, the beginning of the end, really, for Israel. So, any comments? Is it on, Gary? Flip it up. There we go. So what I said was, uh, how long was it after David was anointed king that he actually became king? So the anointing, it seems, was a relationship to God. And then the crowning, crowning or accepted by the people, was a relationship to the people. Even because remember when it was Samuel also that anointed David king, was it not? And while Saul was still king, he traveled and anointed David king. Only David didn't become king until Saul died. Yeah, I thought it was interesting with Samuel, you know, how long it was between the time that God says, you're going to be king. I mean, when you really read that whole narrative, I mean, that was a long time. I mean, obviously David was almost like, I don't think this is ever going to happen. I mean, if I was David. I mean, it was a long period of time in there. And, and they even told David, you know, kill Saul. God's anointed you. You know, kill Saul. Take your place because you've already been anointed. You know God's going to make you king. And David would say, oh, I'm not going to kill the Lord's anointed. And David just had this almost a patience that was almost aggravating, you know, to say, I'm going to wait till God does this, and I'm not going to do it. funny thing is that the guys from Jabesh, Gilead were the ones, I guess Saul must have impressed them because they were the ones that went and took Saul's dead body down when he was killed and being, being, uh, I can't remember, was he on a pike or he was, he was, he he was on a wall, was, wasn't it? His body was desecrated. Yeah. He was nailed to a wall and so they came and took his body down as a means of respect or showing respect for Saul. So he must have, they must have been impressed by his actions as king those many years before. Yeah, I think um, Saul was, uh, you know, Saul fell out of God's grace, but he didn't necessarily fall out of the grace of all the people. I mean, I think sometimes we miss that. You know, Saul was still leading an army, still going to battle against the Philistines when he was killed. Saul fell from God's, Saul basically fell from God's grace, but then Saul remained king for a long period of time after that, before David took that over. So, and the kingdom stayed together under Saul. So, oh gosh, I don't, you know, Gary, right off, how long Saul was king? Yeah, I don't know for sure the answer to that. If it's like everything else, it's 40 years. But, <laughs> no, that's true, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be a good guess if you were guessing. But I don't absolutely know for sure. Anyway, thanks for your time. This evening, Gary, since you got the mic, you want to lead us in a closing prayer tonight?
God in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your word that's left for us to learn from. Thank you, dear God, for the stories of the men of old. And dear God, help us to realize these are real people. These are real heroes of the faith. These are real men of history and not just stories. These things occurred that we have lessons to learn from them. Thank you so much, dear God, for your word that teaches us about you, about your will, about what you expect of us. Pray that we be about your business in the coming week. Pray that you give us opportunities to work in your kingdom. It's through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.